Well, let's talk about that strategy to extract people safely. Joining us now for more on the evacuation effort is Gift to the Givers founder, Dr. Imtia Suleiman. Uh, Dr. Suleiman, good evening to you and welcome to the program. Your team is part of the team helping facilitate the escape of our citizens and other nationals. And there are some complex problems at play. Part of them is uh, that without papers, the task becomes more complicated. Please give us a status update with regard to some of the difficulties tonight. Uh, good evening, Vanessa. There's three parts to this. The one is that the, there's a group of people going to, uh, to to Egypt itself. The two buses that went there, you mentioned it earlier in the news that they had problems. Yes, when they were leaving, we knew the biggest problems, the biggest hurdles going to be the absence of passports, entry visas and exit visas. But unfortunately, the documents were locked up in buildings or in government departments. And with the fighting, nobody could access those documents. Some people had documents, some people didn't even have copies. You just went in, you know, completely with no documentation. So the first lot got there and 30 of them managed to get through. The other eight were kept back. And finally, after our team from our embassy came across this sometime at lunchtime today, they allowed them to go through after filling the irrelevant forms. They waited 26 hours at the, at the border on the Egyptian, on the Sudanese side in 40 degree heat no water, no food, hadn't slept for two days, they were hungry, they were exhausted, but they were out of the war zone. They've come across and 38 of them are now on, well, the balance of the eight are on the way to Aswan right now. The second group have landed up in Port Sudan. Some people made their own arrangements and some people made, the companies made arrangements for them. But for the last two to three days, there's 11 of them stuck in Port Sudan, they can't get out. There's two complications. One is that the country they have to go to is Saudi Arabia, they need permission to enter Saudi, Saudi Arabia on the Saudi ferry boat. And they need permission from the Sudanese authorities to allow them to leave for an exit visa. Both they don't have. The, our, our international relationships is buzzing with Saudi. We think that part will be overcome, where they'll be allowed to get onto the Saudi boat. And where the problem is with the Sudan allowing to them, them to leave, I then managed to speak to advocate Patrick Lutz, who was a special agent for the United Nations on Sudan, a mediator. He made some calls and they agreed. The Sudanese side agreed to let the South Africans leave mm. on condition Saudi accepts them to get onto their boat. And in addition yeah. to that, if that but I got permission, we arranged permission for our military aircraft to land in Port Sudan to pick them up and bring them back home. And the last part is that eight South Africans were you know, are on, on, a, on a bus right now to the Egypt border. And those are the last eight that we need to bring out of the country. Well, not actually the last eight. There's three that we know of that I've spoken to who've opted not to leave. Um, it, it, it certainly sounds like a, a very complex operation and also one that depends on relationships. It depends on trust. It, it depends on having those comms really in, in the moment. And it's, it's really interesting to see how well you're able to, together with Durko, be able to tap into that network. We see reports of buses being held back through skirmishes or transport being held back through skirmishes around Khartoum. Um, you know, some who were meant to board buses got lost in its communication and you've been giving us some insights now as to the complexity um, of doing this. Take us into the fighting aspect of this, how intense it is on the ground and how much added complexity it creates for the extraction effort. Well, the fighting itself from the beginning is a huge emotional, psychological impact. It creates a lot of trauma right from the beginning. And the, remember, all the South Africans are not staying like in one compound. They're spread throughout Khartoum, they're outside Khartoum, they're in different areas. And now they're very resilient. They got together, they formed a group, and they're saying, okay, we, we leave, we're going to leave from here. Last week, it was, we were going to leave to the normal airport, but then the airport got bombed and it was closed. Then there was a secondary airport, 65 kilometers of Khartoum, where the Germans, the Irish, the British, the French started flying out. By the time we could get to that, the airport closed, they were fighting around. The third option was to get buses. Fuel was a problem, buses, getting bus, buses was a problem. People coming across from one area to the other area to meet the buses was a problem. To get through the streets, and that's where a lot of people saw the anxiety. One of the guys said, "My, I was probably in the worst area. I was not far from the presidential palace. The fighting was intense. It was the worst time of my life. When I managed to get out and drove, I, it was Armageddon. Tanks shooting at each other, people shooting at each other, bodies all over in the streets, hospital bombs, buildings bombed. It was terrible. I'm now finally in a safe place. Another lady said, when we saw what's happening in Khartoum, they shot at my husband, rubber bullet, his leg was swollen. 
and we just saw them shooting everybody everywhere. We just ran for our lives 200 kilometers away from Sudan to the south. And they were terrified to come back. It took me over an hour, two nights ago, at half past two in the morning to say, you've got to come back. There's the last bus that's going to leave. So the traumatic aspect and the emotional and psychological aspect has been the biggest problem. Then, of course, the absence of buses. And the other big problem is if you get a bus, you can't pay for it. They want your cash. No banks are functioning. Credit cards can't work. You can't do an EFT. If you don't have cash, no bus. And those were all the challenges. But And, and then, of course, you're talking about skirmishes causing a problem. And that's the reason we couldn't send a bus yesterday. Yeah. You know, the bus in Sudan finally got to Khartoum. People are anxious to go. The bus guys say one hour's time. Okay, two hours' time. Okay, four hours' time. Mm. So we asked what's happening. Great but it look. is a very good company. They knew what was going on on, on, on the roads. Yeah, I mean, you've given us a little taste there, uh, MTRs, of what, you know, what it feels like and, and what it sounds like. And that's what I want to lean into in our last question. Through, the, through your experiences and, and the teams on the ground, you get to formulate a picture a lot of us might not be able to see. We're dealing, it, you know, dealing at it from a political and a diplomatic level. But how would you describe in just a minute, uh, MTRs, because we're almost out of time, what is happening there, what it feels like to be in that environment to somebody who doesn't know? It's, this, this is not something that people are trained for. You know, whether it's diplomats, ordinary people, this is not something you train trained for. It's very, very complicated. And added to that, remember, it's a family emotion. Problem. I explained the earlier emotion to you, the emotional and psychological issue, but there's added, additional factors. The families at home are intense, terrified. Are they going to make it alive? Are they going to get come out? Are they going to get stuck? That's the next problem. The next thing, some of them have been there for years. They're leaving their workplace, they're leaving their colleagues, they're leaving their friends behind to stay in the war. People they become friends with, people they become uh, 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 used to. And the final thing is, the lady says, I have to leave my cat. Another lady says, I have to leave my two dogs. Yeah. And she said, walking out, I could see in the, the, eye, the pain in the dog's eyes. They saw the baggage, but we didn't take them. Fortunately, those two dogs are on the bus today to, to be reunited with that lady yeah. tomorrow. And I, I read somewhere they were they were terriers and they belong to uh, a family that has twin twin children. A quick one at the end, which is very important for the families. When could we expect the South Africans to arrive um, back on South African soil? That's in the hands of the government, but practically not before Friday, because we can't leave some and take some. So we have to wait for the other eight to come through tomorrow. You know, and I'm hoping they'll be tomorrow afternoon in Aswan. And the other eleven, if we, if we can't solve the problem for the ferry boat, then pick up, just fly to Sudan, pick them up, and then maybe by Friday evening or Saturday morning they should be over. Thank you so much, Dr. Imtia Suleiman is with the Gift of the Givers founder, just giving us an update on the extraction and rescue efforts, really, for South Africans trapped in Sudan.